Good morning. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, just a wee bit of background. In a former life, I was head teacher at Portsoy. When I reached bus passage, I retired. But uh, in Portsoy, they don't let you go. They say, oh, no, you're retired. You could do this. And it's a cliche to say that retired people have never been so busy. But quite honestly, that's, that's the truth. Okay, I'm going to be telling, speaking about boats, but so I need to do a bit of explaining about why boats. Uh, Port so- oh, oh, wrong one. Net, net, net. Okay. Port so- uh, about halfway between Fraserburgh and Elgin, on that little bit of coast there. Uh, on the Murray Firth, in a, a very important fisheries area, once upon a time, and all of these little um, little harbours all around the, around the Murray Firth would have had their own harbours and their own boat building. This is a very old map. It's very hard to read, but you can just about see where all, all the harbours would have been, and just about every harbour would have had its own boat building yards, because fishermen being very kind of traditional <coughs> like to see their boats being built. Uh, now there's only one left out of all of those. Uh, once upon a time there would have been huge numbers of fishing boats that followed the herring that would have started up at Shetland in the summertime and finished at Yarmouth just about Christmas. Um, enormous numbers of boats employing hundreds of, of people. Um, this is just a little indication of the development that they will. Oh, wrong one. Uh-uh. They would have uh, begun with uh, small one and two man boats and would have uh, developed into larger. Uh, there would have been the introduction of steam and even more steam based, steam powered boats. Uh, would have become very important round about the 1920s. Um, developed onto diesel power, and f- now, finally, these are the kinds of boats that can no longer fit into the little harbours. Huge steel hulled um, with GPS and all kinds of satellite guidance. So, nothing like the original boats which were left to rot on the shores. I remember these boats being beached because they weren't any good. I mean, what good is a wee boat when you can have one of these big fancy ones? I remember my grandfather saying, I really liked uh, when they they had uh, the steam boilers because you could dry your clays on them. (laughs) But however, was that the end of an era? Well, no. There's quite a lot of interest in traditional boats and there are centres where these boats are still being built or restored. But Soy is one, and that's what I'm going to be telling you about. Other important areas are at, at Anstruther, uh, across at Irvine, up in the Orkneys and Shetlands, across <coughs> towards Ullapool. There are small enclaves of interest in developing uh, and re- maintaining the heritage of wooden boats. Um, and also there's quite a lot of interest in the near continent, and I'll speak about that later. Okay, uh, part of the study that I'm doing at the moment is looking at Port Soy and other communities, but particularly Port Soy, as a boat building community. Here's Port Soy. Most of the year, about 2,000 people in Port Soy. That's what it looks like uh, from the air. It has a very interesting old harbour here, and a new harbour here. Now, the old harbour was built in 1693 and was built as a trading harbour with Scandinavia and the Low Countries, it said. So, but not a fishing harbour. This harbour here, the new harbour, was built in 1820s as a fishing harbour for the, for the herring fishing. Uh, once it would have been full of boats, as you, as you saw from the earlier photographs, but now there are only pleasure craft and a few guys who do line fishing 
or go for crabs and lobsters and things. So, here we are. Here's a, a harbour which is a lot in common with many of the fishing villages along the, the coast of the Murray Firth. Most days it looks like that. Very quiet. But in, 18, sorry, in 1993, there was a celebration of the 300th anniversary of the opening of the Old Harbour. The organisers, all volunteers, invited lots of old wooden boats to come and be in, represented in the harbour. And at that time, it was called the Sma Boats Festival. Now, the Sma Boats uh, came and the people in Portsoy had such fun that they decided to do it again next year. And next year, and we're now in our, we've just had our 23rd boat festival uh, from those very small beginnings. And it has just grown. This is what it's like. On a boat festival weekend, there can be 15,000 people in the town, as opposed to 2,000 that there usually is. And all around the harbour and right far along the shore and back up uh, into the Wally Green and up to the park, there's stuff going on everywhere. So this is a wee picture of what happens during the boat festival, for a start. The harbour gets filled up uh, with traditional wooden boats. There's a great deal of interest in wooden boats. Fifes, Zulus, Scafies, mainly. And a few other oddities that we don't really know what they are. But uh, basically wooden, bo uh, wooden hulled boats that work under sail. Though I have to say, most of them have got engines in them now as well. They invite some of the big boats, one up from Reaper from Anstruther, and Isabella Fortuna comes down from Wick. And these are really seriously big boats. I've got a bit of difficulty getting into that harbour, which is why the boat festival weekend changes from year to year because you need deep water to get uh, these big boats in. But there's things happen out on the sea, lots of races and so on. There's a big interest in coastal rowing, which I'll tell you more about in a minute. Here they are, here's the guys out rowing uh, at the f festival. Great fun. We have an enormous amount of music, which I could speak just about music, but I won't, I'll just mention it in passing. Uh, concerts, busking on street corners, things up on the harbour stage. These are two choirs that came at different times from Norway. We have got good contacts with, with Scandinavia. And they like to come. Uh, we have lots of demonstrations of traditional maritime crafts um, all around the harbour. Um, but also rural crafts. We don't forget uh, our hinterland. So there, there's lots of things like uh, spinning and knitting and woodworking and uh, metalworking. So there's a lot to see. Do come to the boat festival. You'll have a great time. And I, I recently did a talk in uh, Tromsø in Norway, we, and I, I said to them, and did I mention the beer? And they all went, ooh. <laughs> so... Uh, there's a huge food fair uh, where you can taste lots of uh, local produce. There's demonstrations of traditional ways of preparing food. This chap here is very popular. He always has a sign up saying, next batch ready at 11 o'clock and the queue round the block to get these uh, smoked uh, haddock. And they, they usually put him next to the beer tent as well, so he gets a lot of custom. Uh, there's lots for kids to do as well. There's sailing and cycling and uh, event, other events in, up in the park. And there's a road run. And there, th that's just a small taste of what goes on. And that came out of the original small festival that happened round the harbour. We've also made good contacts with North Sea Ring, which is a, an organisation of boat builders from... Uh, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Germany, Holland. And um, two years ago, we had 40 delegates from North Sea Ring came to Port Soy. We're hoping that next year we're going to have even more for, from Forbundet um, Kirsten, which is a, a Norwegian 
group, which apparently has something like 10,000 members. So we're hoping that they're going to come next year. So looking forward to that. Okay, so from the Sma Boat Festival, it became the Scottish Traditional Boat Festival, with the emphasis very much on the traditional boats. But that's not the whole story. And although that's very important to the town of Portsoy, it's very important for the businesses, it's very important for attracting tourism and so on, that's only part of the story. Because out of this came a lot of other uh, enterprises. So, one of the things that's happened has been a big upsurge in the development of youth music. I could speak about youth music, but I won't today. Um, lots of things for, with little primary school children and um, events for kids who are already skilled in music, and that's wonderful. But from my point of view, what's really interesting is the development of youth boat building. So this was the first boat that was um, taken on by a gr group of enthusiasts who had been involved in the boat festival, who got involved with youngsters, and the first boat they built was a fairing. None of the kids had any idea about boat, boat building, so this was a steep learning curve for them. Oops, go back. Okay. But you can see how involved these youngsters became in boat building learned skills that they had no idea about, sail making, rope making, all sorts of things. And if, in the end, the older boys were teaching the younger boys, which w was uh, really what we were hoping would happen. Unfortunately, a lot of these really good older boys uh, got jobs and girlfriends and cars, so there's not maybe quite as many of them around. Though they, they still come back and do boat building with us. Um, here they are, that's their first little boat, their first fairing. It's a, a, a design similar to what's built up in Orkney and Shetland. And I like that they called it Ur Boaty. Uh, that, that was them. And from being very shy teenagers who would hardly speak to anybody, they became very confident and would happily stand up in front of crowds and demonstrate. This is th these, these boys uh, demonstrating rope making, using a machine that they built themselves. So huge confidence that has been developed in youngsters that probably wouldn't have been there before. The next thing we did was to look at the younger group of children, and we took on the building of some optimist dinghies with the primary school-aged kids. We changed the design, and it became the pessimists, and after that, it became the pragmatists, because we had to change the design. Uh, but here they are. We were just astounded how readily youngsters took to this. With guidance, they were able to take on a lot of the processes of boat building. Now, there's no way I could say, to, say that these are, kids are actually would be able to build a boat completely by themselves, but uh, they've had a taste of it, and there's an outcome for that, as I'll tell you in a minute. So here they are, getting their boat, little boat ready. If you, it would be classed as a pram dinghy. And this is what it looks like uh, in the end, that these kids have built these boats, little optimist dinghies, and they have sailed them. And you can see by all the big smiles that they had a wonderful time. And they were just thrilled that they had built this boat and now they were sailing it. So that, that was really, really good for them. Uh, we've actually now built 67 of these little boats and more than 700 kids in the last six years uh, have been through the, through the process. And having said that, because all the, loads of the kids had, had, had been involved in boat building, when they went up to the academy, they were still interested. So some of our volunteers went and volunteered up at Banff Academy. And it started as a lunchtime boat building club. But the Academy was very pleased with what was going on, uh, so there, there are now two boat building classes at Banff Academy, involving about 20 kids in each, and it's offered as an option at Banff Academy. So that was quite a, a big step forward. Uh, another thing that happened was that we spoke to Chevron, the, the oil company, who were also very interested in, a, in employability. Now, it's, there's 
very unlikely that these kids will get a job as boat builders, because I said there's only one, one boat building yard on the coast. But uh, offering them the opportunity to, to um, have experience in work environments, Chevron thought was very important. Now, these... Oh, wrong one. Yeah. Uh, these boys were boys who didn't have learning difficulties, but they found school pretty tough. They didn't want to sit and write essays and so on. Uh, but they are progressing very well. They come along and work with our volunteers, and they're in the middle of uh, building a nice little uh, skiff, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, the, here they are, once again, very shy kids to begin with, but speaking to the top executives and our MP, Ailey Whiteford, and the head of services in Aberdeenshire. So that was a big step forward for them, and really quite prestigious for Port Soy. Um, I mentioned coastal rowing. Our women took on coastal rowing. They saw a demonstration of the St. Ailes skiffs that came to the boat festival, and they decided they wanted one. So um, the planks are pre-cut by a company run by Alex Jordan. It's based on a design uh, produced by the historian Ian Uhtred, and you can see that these women had a wonderful time. And somebody facetiously said, suppose you're going to paint your boat pink then? And they said, yes. So you can see that it was. So they raised money and they, they, they had a wonderful time. They didn't actually know if this boat was going to float, but it did, uh, and proved itself to be very seaworthy. Um, I don't know if you can just make them up. That there is my husband. And he said they couldn't see the size of the waves that were coming, but I could. So, <laughs> so that was fine. Uh, the men decided that a pink boat wasn't for them, so they built themselves a green boat. Um, it's, it's not the case that there's a separation between the men and the women. Everybody mixes in together, but we've got two boats now. One's called Soy Quine and one's called Soy Loon. So there. And we'll have wonderful times. Uh, coastal rowing is great fun and very um, competitive or relaxing, depending on you know, how you want to do it. Our youngest members are 14 and our oldest are 70. And they're 70, so anybody can do it. I love it. And that's just to let you know that the sun does shine and it isn't always rough water. This is one of the girls that began with us and she's teaching... Uh, some of the younger boys uh, how about rowing and you can see there's the, the pink oars out the pink boat and the, they're in the green boat so just to let you know uh, that that goes on. Another boat building project that was taken on was the cobble. Salmon fishing was very important all around our coast but it collapsed in the 1990s <coughs> and the traditional wooden salmon cobbles were left to rot. This is one it's called Ter it's called Tern um, and Tern was left to rot up in a field beside Port Soy. It was beyond redemption. So our volunteers took it apart, took every measurement and every angle and drew proper plans because most of the original boats were built by line of sight and w weren't, there were no plans at all. But we ha now have a full set of plans and w we have a record of how these boats were built. We had one boat builder. We had one boat builder. <laughs> so it was a big learning curve for everybody. So that's how it finished off. There was lots to learn about uh, planking and clinker built and roving and so on. And that's what happened. The boat is 26 feet long. It's called Soil Lady and it was named at this year's boat festival. But boat built Excuse me, boat building is only one aspect. The, the group that organised the boat festival took on this building, which was the Salmon Bothy, or Ice House, and it had been left to become derelict. They took it on and renovated it. That's what it looks like now. There's a small museum and a centre for genealogy in there. And this bit up here that would have been the net loft is a place that community has taken on for all kinds of projects. 
So there's a folk club and a knitting group. There are concerts, there's weddings, there's book launches. There's all, just you name it, it has become a, an extremely important uh, centre for Port Soy, a hub of all kinds of different activities. The next thing that the group did was take on the caravan park because Aberdeenshire was giving up the caravan parks. Uh, apparently they were running at a loss, uh, but we, th we've been running that one for the last three years and it hasn't made a loss. And they took on this building, that's next door to the, the that there is the pub known as the Shore Inn, and it was, that was known locally as the Shore Oot. So uh, it was taken on, to, because there was all this boat building, the boat builders really needed a home. We had plans built, we thought they were terribly ambitious, but it all came together. And that's what it looks like now. Uh, the, this is the grand opening of the boat shed, and this is the Duke of Kent uh, who came to do the opening. So very prestigious for we Pertsoli. Still being used, uh, this is a, a small Zulu skiff that's being built here. This is some of the skills that are still being used. This is a chap that's building a prototype harbour tender, and this is a small scale salmon cobble which went into the museum. And one more thing that they did was take on another derelict building, but it was full of them. That. That was the rope and sail making works. Uh, again, left to be derelict after the f collapse of the fishing industry. It was taken on and it's now going to be a hostel. Uh, it's nearly, the, oh, go back to there. That's, that was about a month ago, it's nearly finished. It's going to be on for this year's boat festival. So it's beautifully finished inside, I would recommend it. So there we go, here we started with the boats and the boat festival, we've now got the, the sail loft, the caravan park, the bothy and the, and the boat shed. And out of all of that, they decided they'd better become something more official. And they've decided now that they've become Portsoy Community Enterprise, because it's been more than about boats. So really, a big compliment to all of these people, all volunteers who took that on and made it work for Portsoy. Thank you.